Uh, thanks for joining us for this late afternoon talk on Cruise Self-Driving Networking Journey. And so I'm Bernard, and this is my colleague John. We both work in. Oh, okay. So we both work into the platform as a service. Is this better? Yes. Okay. We both work into the platform as a service team, and more specifically into the traffic team. And so this means we handle things like service mesh, networking issues, ingress, and so on. And this is what we like to do when we don't need to debug ingresses. OK, so we both work for Cruise. Cruise is a self-driving car company headquartered in San Francisco. We are backed by a couple of the giants in the automotive industry, such as General Motors and Honda. Um, we are aiming to build the world's most advanced self-driving vehicles to safely connect people with the places, things, and experiences they care about. And this means if you went over the last couple of weeks or months into the city, to San Francisco, you probably saw some of those cars driving around. They are still learning, but eventually we want to make this a public service. What you can see on this slide is an animation of WebViz. WebViz is one of our open source tools that we use a lot internally as a front-end way for replaying some of the car rides. Say, say. OK. I hope that you are hearing me. Is it OK? Yes. Louder? OK, <laughs> let's try. OK, my name is John, and I am the uh, technical lead of the PaaS traffic team at Cruise. And our basic focus here is network reliability. So our focus overlaps with our journey here, which covers like, these multiple topics. Like we, Our journey will be spanning uh, multiple cloud providers. And we have these multi-tenant clusters that span through multiple environments and multiple regions. Our DNS story covers uh, Route 53, Core DNS, Cloud DNS, and it is not listed here, but unfortunately, it's still Cube DNS. <laughs> and like we do have these private and public L7 and L4 load balancer. And I had the opportunity for being the one of the very first uh, past team members, so I was able to just experience this growth where we have just spun up our very first uh, GKE cluster where we were running a few pods on them. And as of this week, we are running somewhere around 70k pods in average uh, among all our clusters. So basically, we are going to cover these five topics in general, like network connectivity, ingress traffic, monitoring and logging, security, and hybrid DNS, but in not that order. <laughs> so the, uh, the story started with provisioning our first GKE cluster. So we had three goals here. So one of them was uh, we wanted to have an isolated cluster. So we uh, wanted to isolate it from the public internet. And we wanted to just uh, connect this cluster to our internal network. And we needed to have a repeatable configuration uh, among these three different environments. And we have picked some RFC 1918 uh, compliance, uh, like CIDR blocks, which are class A's for the nodes, uh, B's for the pods, and C's for the services. OK, uh, this is the uh, first attempt. Let's try to connect from this pod A to a service running in AWS. So uh, initial attempt only included VPN tunnels, because why VPN tunnels? It was easy to set up things. And then uh, the traffic was going through like, public internet, uh, through IPsec uh, encryption. And also, we didn't need to disturb uh, our NetEng uh, team, so we were able to just set up things by ourselves. And the first problem, so what went wrong? We made this first request. Oh, OK, maybe I should just put this. I think it is better now. Anyway, so the first request from this pod A to service B, and the request timed out. So what was wrong here? Like, uh, we were pretty sure that we have defined our return routes because we were able to access from this GCE instance to this uh, service on AWS, and everything is looking fine. But it didn't work for the GKE cluster. Uh, the main reason was these private GKE clusters, uh, by default, uh, were coming up with IP mask agents installed. And with that said, like, even though we had these return routes for nodes, we didn't have any return routes defined for our pods. And that was why, as soon as the request or the response hits the customer gateway, the packages were getting dropped. And because this 172-something IP address was unknown. And the solution was tweaking IP mask configurations. 
So uh, the left-hand side has the default IP mask configurations where it thinks that the whole internal network is a flat network, so we are able to reach everything else around there, but it wasn't true on our case because we, didn't, uh, we specifically didn't advertise these class Bs and class Cs because we were planning to reuse them across the different environments, and that was why. And whenever you make a request to something uh, with class A address, uh, IP mask wasn't uh, masquerading or source netting the request, and that was causing the trouble. So uh, for this particular case, we have picked the side range that the cluster was running on. So there is this small detail here. So the cluster was running on this side range, and like it matches with this. And this is just a highlighted overview of what we have. This is a common slide uh, that uh, we use internally. So we do have these three regions, dev, staging, and prod. They are all connected to each other. And then uh, on all these environments, we are running multiple clusters for multiple purposes or on multiple regions. So this is the topology that we have. OK, so you probably you already had the question, like, how are these guys going to scale with VPN tunnels? No, we can't. So the idea or the goal here, or the problem here was uh, we, like it's pretty easy or straightforward to hit into this n square tunnel problem because whenever you introduce a new network, you need to just establish uh, VPN connections with all other networks that you have. You need to manually or statically just update your route tables, which is going to be tedious and like chaotic pretty soon. And also like IPsec uh, calls or the whole is public internet with IPsec, like, it is going to be a reduced performance problem. And the network engineering team solution here was uh, leveraging interconnects. So with that, we were able to connect all every new network to these interconnects, so, uh, which provided us like a, a couple of things. So we had these BGP routers. They were responsible for dynamically advertising all these uh, routes internally. So we don't need to manually manage them. That was one thing. And we also had physical dedicated connections between interconnects and other networks, and which provided us like, to like, get rid of IPsec. That was one thing. And the other thing was we had uh, like improved bandwidth, which was around 100 gigabit per second, which is also a good gain. And yep. That's pretty much it. So normally, this is a very highlighted overview of uh, how things are set up on the networking level. There are more details. So if you want, you can check out this link. And shout out to Carl and Buck, who put uh, this blog post together. Thanks, John. Um, OK. So we started to scale horizontally our clusters at some point. So when we reached the critical mass for a single cluster, we decided to create more clusters per environment. So this means more cluster in dev, more cluster in staging, and in prod. And the way we decided to do this was to create one subnet on the VPC per cluster. And the first challenge was for each cluster, you need a new set of IP ranges. As you probably know, in Kubernetes, you need one IP range for your nodes, one for your pods, and one for your services. And so it's kind of difficult to, to choose um, those IP ranges automatically because they depend on um, which env environment you are in. It will be different if you're in the dev VPC or staging VPC, which region you want your cluster to be in, as well as what's the sizing of the cluster. The sizing of the cluster is kind of tricky because you need to know in advance how big your cluster is eventually going to be because once you create a cluster in a subnet, it's extremely difficult to resize it to a bigger IP range. And so, we came with a set of constraints. We wanted our node IPs to be globally unique. We wanted to do this so that from anywhere inside Cruise, it would be easy to reach any of the node IPs from the cluster. We also wanted our pod IPs and service IPs to be only locally unique per VPC. So those could be reused per, um, across VPCs. So you could reuse the same pod IPs in dev and in staging, for example. And so the challenge here was that it was extremely tedious to choose manually all of those IP ranges based on those constraints. So what we did um, a couple of months ago is to automate this by using Jerry. Say hi to Jerry. Jerry is a small tool that is automatically connecting to our IPAM, IP management tool in the back end. We use Netbox at Cruise, and it's automatically going to use those constraints as, as parameters, and you will get assigned a set of IP ranges for your clusters. 
So this is how we automatically create clusters based on those IP ranges. And by the way, we learned something on the way is that it's quite valuable to, to have a meta view of all your clusters in a single place. For us, it's Netbox because it, it will help you to debug some crazy corner cases when something goes wrong and you need to re-engineer based on the source IP, which pod or which node IP it comes from, from which cluster. Okay, next thing I would like to talk about is service ingestion. And as the traffic team, this is one of the main things we deal with day to day. Um, we talk to a lot of internal tenants and they all want to somehow make their service available. That makes sense, right? So we made this uh, chart flow. It basically, it, um, it will make it easy for, for a customer to decide or an internal tenant which type of service they need to, to use in order to make the, the microservice or pods available. So let's go over this. Um, the first one that makes the most sense is what if you are inside the same cluster? In which case, very simply, you just need to create a Kubernetes service. This works out of the box. We all use it. It's fine. Okay, next one. What if you are inside Cruise, but not in the same cluster, and you need a TCP or UDP socket? So something like layer three or layer four. For this, um, we allow our, our internal tenants to use self-service themselves with a service of to type load balancer with annotation, and this will automatically create an internal load balancer and make whatever microservice is behind it available all over Cruise. Okay, the next one, I want to spend a bit more time on it because it's what we use the most at Cruise. It's a layer seven ingress, so for private traffic. This probably represents about 95% of our traffic at Cruise. Um, it's basically layer seven internal traffic coming from other clusters or other endpoints or other VMs or something. Um, we decided to use a standard ingress resource to deal with this. We also decided to use upstream Nginx ingress and we are pretty happy with it. Um, we started by deploying this as a standard in-cluster set of pods. The only tweak we made was to use a dedicated node pool to make sure that we don't get into some type of uh, resource congestion or like noisy neighbor so that each Nginx ingress controller could use the full node for himself. And we also enabled um, one of those parameters called external traffic policy, which allows the load balancer in front to help check each of the nodes in a way that the node will only be available if an ingress Nginx instance is, is present on that node. So why do we want to do this? Because you don't want to send traffic to a node that doesn't have an Nginx ingress instance, because if you do that, QProxy is going to redirect it to another node with an actual instance available. So by doing this, you basically avoid, in the worst case, one extra hop, so it's better for performances. So we've, we had our first big outage on the 4th of July by using this. We called it the firework outage. Um, what happened is we found out that the internal load balancers from Google can only help check maximum 250 nodes. And so when you have a cluster way bigger than 250 nodes, what happens is 250 nodes will be selected randomly to be health checked. And we had a cluster so big that all the Nginx ingress instances randomly got out of the health check. So this black hole, the traffic, and yeah, that was quite a big outage. So we decided as a lesson learned to decouple Nginx ingress from Kubernetes and to move it out of the cluster. So we didn't find a lot of people doing this, but we are quite happy with this new configuration. Um, Basically, the way we manage this now is it's into an in, a managed instance group on GC directly, which means it can be scaled completely independently from Kubernetes. We scale it today based on the CPU usage. Um, it's still opening a Kubernetes API watch to the Kubernetes cluster, doing this out of the cluster, and the traffic is still sent directly to the pods, so you don't really lose any performance doing this. Okay, let's talk a bit about public traffic. So we don't have today a lot of public traffic, but we still support it in the same way that we support private traffic. So that means if you need a TCP or UDP socket, what we do is, by the way, we highly discourage this, but if you need it, we will create a public network balance, a load balancer for you with a public IP, and it's up to your workload to handle MTLS and firewall it heavily. As you guessed, we push people to use layer seven, so we use also ingress for public traffic. We initially used GLBC, um, 
we, but we decided to standardize on Nginx ingress because we wanted to have the same set of metrics, both for private and for public, the same set of logs and same set of metrics. It makes it way easier to, to manage. And so what we did is simply we duplicated the private setup for ingress and made it public, and we differentiate both of those ingresses with annotation, with a different annotation. And so this is what's running today on our clusters. So for each cluster, we got one public and one private out of the cluster ingress. Okay, and this brings me to one lesson that we learned is you want to support a small subset of, of options, but support them well. What we do at, uh, as part of the traffic team is we push people to use layer seven ingress, and that's why we support it the best. What you can see on this slide is the two type of annotations that we document internally for using the private or public ingress. Okay. So let's talk about a little bit about our DNS story here. So uh, again, I will start with the most naive approach that we followed here, which is, okay, we do have all our records stored on uh, as Route 53, Route 53 records, and then we have these DNS mask agents running uh, on AWS, which were just uh, pulling these uh, like DNS records. So with this initial attempt, what we have done here is we have updated cube DNS top domain, so whenever there's some internal request, it was forwarding these requests to the DNS proxy that we're running on another network, and like problem solved, at least for a month or so, it was solved. And then like we like uh, started running into some latency issues we, because we were just uh, having these additional network hops which were not ideal at all. So the second attempt, okay, we noticed that we can use core DNS because it already has this Route 53 plugin and it's gonna just solve the problem for us. Was it? Like, uh, this was one of the other moments that we realized that there is no free lunch and then by default, core DNS Route 53 backend only supported A records and also it was programmed to fetch all these records one by one. And considering that you have hundreds of instances and AWS has this uh, like five requests per second uh, throttle length limitation, like it wasn't ideal. So uh, another shout out to a former colleague, uh, Dimitri did the heavy lifting here. He did, uh, he contributed to the plugin and then I made things product ready. And what happened in the end was we were able to just fetch all the records with the exception of alias records, which was kind of fine for the time. And then we did the exact same uh, configuration here. So cube DNS uh, was configured through stop domain. So we were running these core DNS instances, uh, by the way, externally. These were not running on the clusters. Uh, these were external. And cube DNS was for, uh, doing conditional forwarding to these core DNS instances. And core DNS was periodically syncing AWS records. It wasn't synchronously forwarding the request to AWS. That was the critical point. Okay, so that's um, mitigated the problem for us, but there was one other problem left here. Okay, we have resolved the problem for Kubernetes, but what about the other GCE instances? Because like they were still lacking of this functionality and we uh, were being lucky back in the days because I think they, Google introduced the very first version of cloud DNS and as soon as it came up uh, or as soon as we enabled it, uh, like we were able to define these conditional forwarders for our internal domains. So the picture here is when you enable this, uh, any of your GC instances like forwards the request to metadata server, from there it hits cloud DNS, from cloud DNS core DNS, and so forth. So by the way, like the, I also noticed something here. I'm just going a little bit sideways here. Yesterday I uh, attended uh, one of the core uh, maintainers of core DNS young and then uh, his whole talk was based on hybrid DNS structure where he used or showcased uh, AWS and cloud DNS backends and I felt like that okay at least uh, we had some sort of impact on the open source community uh, with this contribution because otherwise like probably it wouldn't be included in the demo. <laughs> 
uh, okay, uh, aside from these DNS servers, we also have some common DNS structure at Cruise, which is we do have these A records which are pointing to our load balancers and these are multi-tenant clusters, so whenever they uh, like define a new DNS record, instead of you directly using the load balancer IP, they are using these uh, C names that we uh, like created. So the advantage of having this sort of approach is whenever you make a change on your load balancer level, uh, such as like a static IP change or you introduce a brand new load balancer, you don't need to just update all your records around. Instead, you just update your A records and the problem solved. Cool, okay, next thing I would like to talk about is observability and logging and metrics. So as part of the traffic team, one of the things we need to deal with the most is our internal tenants asking us, did you see that flow coming to your ingress gateways? And that's why we made a point of having really good ingress logs. So every hit to our ingress gateways will result, in, result into one log on Stackdriver for us. We tweaked it a bit to add the ingress name and ingress namespace so that it's really easy for people to filter on. So you can find in a single click every traffic going to our gateways. Next thing is metrics. So the same Nginx ingress uh, gateways are actually reporting a lot of metrics, very valuable metrics. We added, in, again, the ingress name and namespace as a parameter so that people can filter really easily on it. Part of those metrics is how many, what's the HTTP status, status return. You can see graphs of those things. You can actually set up alerts. And a lot of internal teams are using this as a way to alert if their internal service is down. And by the way, this is, brings us to another lesson learned, is we got an internal team called the Juno team, which is building a um, higher layer of, of abstraction on top of our Kubernetes services. Um, and from this Juno front-end tool, you can directly, in one single click, access all your metrics and logging for your services. And so this is very valuable for people so that they can directly go and find their logs and metrics and shout out to the observability and uh, Juno team. Okay, so there is another kind of fun story. So, um, okay, ingress monitoring. Uh, one of the, or we faced this particular incident a couple of times. So we are just uh, sleeping well uh, on our beds and then everything is looking fine, we, didn't receive, we don't receive any alerts or anything at all, but the problem is as soon as we wake up, we are just, uh, we start receiving some client uh, like calls, which is, okay, the, or, the load balancer is down. Usually they are not saying that, they are just saying that DNS is, isn't working, so there's a problem there. And okay, like the problem here is, um, Mean time to response is pretty high. I think about that, like we are responding within a couple of hours when an incident happens. So how can we um, mitigate this problem? So okay, we need uh, a bunch of probers around and we need to just pick one of the uh, existing SaaS products and this SaaS product needs to work for both of our private and public uh, endpoints because uh, whenever you have this choice, like you're gonna just eliminate uh, most of the options there, and eventually we were planning to help our tenants to identify problems early on. So uh, we picked Runscope for these purposes, and we also developed uh, our Runscope controller thing. Why Runscope? Because it supported both public and private endpoints. We were able to just run some Datadog, sorry, uh, Runscope agents internally, and they were allowed to just ping our internal endpoints. And then we built this Runscope controller thing around that, and uh, the idea here was just monitoring ingress resources and then picking these host name and service backend pairs and then create, creating Runscope uh, tests as a result. And like, it worked fine. So these are just some of the annotations that it had. I'm not gonna get into the details regarding Runscope stuff, so. Basically what we can focus here are, um, so you're gonna just say that I am enabling API tests for my ingress. This is the health checking uh, path and we are gonna run this uh, with this given internal and this is the prefix where you, we can uh, prioritize your stuff which is an optional and internal thing for us. Okay, now the lesson learned part. 
So the uh, first lesson learned uh, was uh, like we noticed that it is not an easy job to create controllers. Like I was underestimating the work about that we are going to do a couple of crowd requests. How hard can it be? But well, it was hard. But <laughs> aside from that, um, the second Kubernetes related problem here was, OK, we had this internal prober running uh, on our cluster, which was pinging the ser given service IP and pod uh, afterwards. And again, a customer just reported an outage here. And then they again said that internal load balancer isn't working or DNS isn't working, whatever. And OK, but prober is uh, saying the opposite here. What is wrong? And the problem here was uh, when you have load balancer type services, uh, depending on the IP tables rules, Kubernetes doesn't do hairpinning. So instead of going outside of the cluster and the request coming back inside, it, just, it is just directly hitting these service IPs. So we were unable to identify these load balancer problems by running agents only internally. So as a solution, we started just having these cross-cluster probers uh, where we started using uh, all over the place. Okay, uh, thank you, John. Let's talk a bit about security. How do we secure our clusters? Um, by the way, I want to start this by saying that at Cruise, we push every workload to use Open and OZ. That's kind of out of scope for this slide. But from a pure networking perspective, from layer three, layer four, we have the following model. So. From inside the VPC, by default, anything inside the VPC is able to reach the cluster, the, the pod IPs and the service IPs. From outside the VPC, by default, it's a whitelist only, so you need to add an entry to be able to access a cluster or a specific IP. And so um, for our ingress, we, we explicitly allowed our ingress controllers on the whitelist. And so, yeah, the, um, the other thing we don't do today is we don't have network policies enabled on our clusters, but we, we are actually considering enabling maybe a default namespace isolation on that level. Okay, something else that you might have heard about before, we released KRL, um, it's on GitHub. That's, it was produced by our sister team, the security team. Um, and KRL is an admission webhook controller. The way it works is whenever you create a new deployment or a new set of pods, it will validate it and make sure that there is no forbidden or insecure parameters. So for example, you don't want to have a pod with host network enabled. You don't want to have extra network capabilities, et cetera, et cetera. The cool one is you also don't want to enable by default any public ingress to be created. You want those to be whitelisted um, so, that by def so that someone doesn't create like a public endpoint by mistake, for example. And so something we learned is if you are going to block some of the user requests, you need to have a pretty user-friendly output. So KRL does this, and it will actually tell you exactly why your pod or deployment is being rejected. And so the whole, the whole model behind KRL is by default deny a lot of things, and then we can add exemption and whitelist some things to be allowed. Okay, so let's close on this with some of the current challenges that we are facing today. Um, the first one, and maybe the most pressing one, it's multi-cluster, specifically multi-cluster ingress. We are at that point in which we are load balancing a lot of our workloads across multiple clusters, but we don't have a clear way today to accept traffic in a single point and redirect it smartly to different clusters, at least not internal traffic. So we are looking at this. Istio might be an answer. We are not sure yet. So yeah, we are looking at different options. So another problem uh, that we have faced during of, uh, one of our other outages was uh, like the lack of visibility. With that, what we mean is uh, we do have these multi-tenant clusters where every node is running at least uh, 50 pods in average. And then whenever uh, a couple of those start saturating your egress traffic, which might be happening through your NAT instances, we are unable to say or identify which uh, one of those workloads are causing this because we were able to just address the particular node, but we didn't have the granularity on the pod level. So that uh, is one of the reasons why uh, we started looking into service mesh solutions, as Istio specifically, and we are hoping to just come up with better uh, dashboards around. And another issue here is 
like, um, okay, aside from uh, having improved visibility, the other problem is we have um, a couple of levels of isolations, isolations on our multi-tenant clusters. So Docker already provides CPU and memory level isolation, it's fine. Uh, but uh, there are still two other levels of isolations are missing. One is disk IO, and luckily it is not a problem of path traffic team. And the second one is uh, network, uh, like quality of service stuff, because like we would like to have some sort of uh, egress and in ingress traffic limitation set up. And the other thing is uh, we still need to do a couple of DNS enhancements. Uh, with this said, what we mean is, okay, we are just facing the exact same problems with everyone else regarding cube DNS, and we, would like to, we don't want to just get details of that because there are already a couple of good talks around those. And our problems are, or the solutions here will be replacing cube DNS with core DNS and later on enabling node local uh, DNS cache. And as a third piece, we also have this, uh, like, uh, delegation ownership problem because as we have shown, all the records are, or at least most of the records are stored on AWS, so we would like to just create subdomains and delegate the ownership to some sub teams and still the DNS resolution sh should work. And last but not least, so we would like to just come up with our load testing framework because whenever you start talking about Istio and service mesh, there is this additional uh, latency cost and we would like to make sure about that it is not gonna be a problem for some of our customers. So we are planning to just come up with numbers and tell them that, okay, this is the additional latency cost. If you're okay with that, you can just leverage these service mesh uh, like advantages, if not whatever. And also we are planning to just uh, make this a common tool where our customers can use for their uh, all sort of load testing purposes. So that's it for today. Like if you do have any questions we would like to hear, other than that, if you have questions that you can ask, you can just find us at a party. So <laughs> it will be much more fun to answer those questions when we are drunk. Yep. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.